Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, the Biden administration has released its racial equity agenda. We talk with the leaders of both the National and Chicago Urban League about their hopes for the next four years. We'll head south and travel back in time with this week's selection in our Black Voices Book Club on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Remembering the original fly girl, aviatrix Bessie Coleman, who was born 129 years ago last week. I was really excited to go see a black owned shop. And we'll see how a local black owned plant shop is seeing business bloom during the pandemic. First off tonight, in November's election, black voters were instrumental in putting Joe Biden into the Oval Office. In his victory speech, Biden told those voters, quote, you've always had my back and I'll have yours. Now in the early weeks of his presidency, we're beginning to see how President Biden intends to make good on that promise with the undoing of some of the Trump administration's policies, as well as the release of his racial justice and equity agenda. Joining us to talk about civil rights during the Biden presidency are Karen Freeman Wilson, president of the Chicago Urban League, and that is Mark Morial, president of the National Urban League. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices and thank you for joining us. So, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. So Biden was the first president to ever address white supremacy in his inaugural address. Here's a little bit of what he had to say. A cry for racial justice some 400 years in the making moves us. The dream of justice for all will be deferred no longer. And now, a rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism that we must confront and we will defeat. And Mark Morial, let's start with you, please. Do you think the Biden administration will be able to combat this, the threat of right wing uh, conspiracy and violence that we're seeing across the country? It's going to take everything they have. And first of all, thank you for having me to defeat uh, the tide of white supremacy and violent extremism. The defeat of Donald Trump and all that he represented, his political philosophy, his approach to governing, uh, his hatred and racism was a step by the American people to say to the new president, we embrace a different approach. We want to go in a different direction. And now Joe Biden has been in office now nine days, I believe, nine days, I believe. And I think the first steps he's taken uh, have been uh, remarkable in that uh, no prior president that I can remember act, has acted so decisively to put down several markers when it comes to issues of racial justice. But let's qualify it by saying we're nine days in and this so is you, only the beginning and much more needs to be done. So you feel like he's sending a, a very clear signal then. Uh, Karen Freeman Wilson, you know, we saw a demonstration by white supremacists in front of City Hall here last week. Uh, how do you feel like Biden's presidency uh, will affect issues like policing here in Chicago? Uh, let me add my thanks and also um, support what Mark just said. Uh, there is a clear message being sent that we want to engage differently that white supremacy is not welcome in D.C. or in any aspect of the federal government. And not only is it not welcome, but that President Biden will use his administration's resources to get at the root of white supremacy and to uncover that, um, that in, in the military, in places where he has federal jurisdiction, which I think is extremely important. 
Mark Morial, uh, you and the National Urban League, you all wrote a letter to President Biden upon his inauguration. Um, we've seen him in just this week, the last few days, roll out his racial equity agenda. Uh, how does his agenda line up for what you called for in your letter? Well, I think his first steps were important in that what he did was he signed an, exec an executive order that said to all of the agencies of government, all of the departments of government, you have 200 days to assess and evaluate uh, whether they're disparities, uh, racial animus, racial disparities in your programs and policies and to report back. Uh, I think what is happening is the framework is being put down uh, for significant action on issues related to, uh, if you will, racial justice. So I uh, embrace the early steps but I'm not uh, spiking the ball or popping a bottle of champagne because these are just initial steps that demonstrate that uh, I'm not putting racial justice on the back burner and I'll get to it later. Uh, I'm not ignoring it after I said in my acceptance speech and in my inaugural address that racial justice is gonna be a central principle to everything we do uh, as an administration. So uh, and of, it's, yeah. No, I was just gonna add, sorry. So it sounds like, you know, lots of work to do going forward, because as you said, it's only been nine days. Uh, Karen Freeman Wilson, you know, to that end, what can groups like the Urban League do to address the inequities of the pandemic on the local level? Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that we focus on the local level on the immediate needs of people. Right now, it's to ensure that blacks get the vaccine. We know that there is some skepticism. And so we are working with the state, with the city and the county to ensure that people understand that one of the best ways to fight back against COVID uh, in addition to testing and washing your hands and all of the things that we've been doing masks for a long time is to now get the vaccine. And um, that's something that the Chicago Urban League has placed front and center. In addition to that, it's the need for relief to those who have seen so many challenges as a result of this pandemic particularly black businesses. And that is why we promoted Black Shop Friday on Black Friday this last year. Yeah, that's right, I remember that. Um, mayor Morial, excuse me, Mark Morial, former mayor of New Orleans. Um, most of President Biden's cabinet nominations, they are still awaiting confirmation by the Senate, but it's looked like he's appointed uh, a far more diverse uh, cabinet uh, than we've seen in the past. What are your thoughts on how that diversity might influence his actions going forward? Well, let's talk about some of the individuals. First of all, there's Marsha Fudge, who will head the Department of Housing and Urban Development and who will wake up an agency that's been in a deep sleep for many years. Uh, there's General Lloyd Austin, a native of Mobile, Alabama, a decorated general who becomes Secretary of Defense. There's Susan Rice, who have uh, hold of the Domestic Policy Council, which is central in shaping initiatives around racial justice and other issues with the domestic policy portfolio. There's Dr. Cecilia Rouse, who is the first black person to chair the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And there's Cedric Richmond, who will be assistant to the President for public engagement. And I'm naming a few, because these are people that, uh, people in the nation, people across the land, people in black America need to get to know. Uh, each and every one of the people I've named, I've had the opportunity to observe or work very closely with. And not only are they committed, uh, they are more than, if you will, qualified and experienced to make things happen within the government. So the diversity uh, top line message or top line observation is positive. But when you look at the people, uh, some of the people, particularly the African-Americans who be joining the administration, uh, I'm excited because they're not novices. Uh, they are not uh, uh, people who are going to have to learn on the job. 
they're hitting the ground running because there is a mess to clean up after four years of Donald Trump. Um, and briefly, we've got about 20 seconds left. Mark Morial, you were at uh, inauguration. What did that mean to you to see the vice president sworn in? It was cold, but to see uh, Kamala Harris and Amanda Gorman, to see these two powerful sisters, two powerful black women, uh, talented black women just brought a great deal of pride to me as it, uh, I believe, does for all Americans. Uh, it, it's a moment of great accomplishment for Kamala Harris. Uh, and, and I think she is just well positioned to be a great vice president. And I think go beyond. <laughs> Outstanding. My thanks to Mark Morial and Karen Freeman Wilson for joining us. All the best. Thank you. Bessie Coleman was the first black American woman and Native American woman to hold a pilot's license, but she had to cross an ocean to do it. Tonight, we're throwing it back to a 2002 Chicago Stories with John Calloway about the famously glamorous aviatrix who was born 129 years ago last week. But when Coleman tried to enroll at the aviation school, as Abbott had arranged, she found the doors closed again. Two female students at the school had recently died in crashes. The school had decided to no longer teach women this dangerous occupation. Undaunted, Coleman found another school that would take her. Bessie enrolled in a seven-month course of study, which she passed with flying colors. At that time, France was the only country issuing pilot licenses. And so for that reason, she became the first licensed African-American pilot. Coleman had the additional honor of being the first American woman of any color to receive an international pilot's license. She beat Amelia Earhart to the prize by more than two years. Now that she was a certified aviatrix, as female flyers were then known, Coleman wanted an image to match her new daredevil skills. She designed a flight costume that would become her trademark upon her return to America. When she walked to the plane, she was clad in this uniform with a leather coat slung over her shoulders. Uh, the helmet was on, but the goggles were pushed up so that people could see her pretty face. She was really glamorous. This was, uh, this was like a film star. The news of her success produced excitement and astonishment in the United States when she arrived in New York City in the early fall of 1921. There was a considerable interest from the white press, and then the editor suggested that she pass for white, and she just laughed at him. And she said, look, you know, I am black. I don't want to be known as white. This is my special victory, that I am black and I fly. The Chicago Defender made her front page news. She told a reporter, I thought it my duty to risk my life to learn aviation and to encourage flying among men and women of our race who are so far behind the white race in this modern study. From the Old Slave Mart Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, to Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas, the history of the civil rights movement spans decades all across the South. While many of us aren't traveling much during the pandemic, this next selection in our Black Voices Book Club will certainly transport you to the dozens of historic sites, churches, and businesses along what is known as the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Journalist and author Deborah Douglas would know she literally wrote the book it's called U.S. Civil Rights Trail, a traveler's guide to the people, places, and events that made the moment. It's part travel guide, part time machine, and it was just released this month. Deborah, thanks for joining us. I have to tell you, as a Southerner originally, I grew up in Mississippi, college in New Orleans. I've lived in Arkansas, Alabama, Texas. This book made me homesick, so I am glad that I had the chance to read it. Um, you know, this one explores a lot of different places, but it also explores years of history. What can people expect? Well, it is a travel guide and it's a history book, but it's also a guide to civics. It explains how our democracy works, something that we've often forgotten um, in recent history. And I hope that it's also a roadmap to help people understand where st they stand on the issues today. 
So like a traditional travel guide, as you said, of course, there are, you know, food and shopping recommendations, but they aren't necessarily, you know, the food and shopping recommendations that you might get in, you know, a typical travel guide. How did you go about finding these spots and any favorites that stand out? Well, I was very intentional about how I curated this experience. So the first thing is that uh, other, it, unless otherwise stated, every business that you interface with is a black owned business. I am interested in ethical travel and I'm interested in sending people into communities and leaving those communities a little bit better off uh, than when you came in. And in terms of how I found them, it involved lots and lots of spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be really organized. You say ethical travel. Quickly tell us what that means. Well, along the way, I met a lot of people in black communities who are used to storytellers or other individuals coming into their community, learning about their history, and then just going away and never returning. Some people like journalists and authors and playwrights, they make something of value out of the story and then they never really share the results or give the credit to the people whose story this is. And so I just wanted to make sure that I was intentional about respecting the people who live in these communities. Now, one of my favorite features was get into the rhythm. So if there is not a playlist, you know, on Spotify for some of the songs that you recommended, I will make it myself. Why did you <laughs> want to include that? Well, you know, I'm a great migration baby. I was born in Chicago in Austin. My father ran a business there for a couple of decades and uh, my parents split early. So I started school in post uprising Detroit. But also I spent a lot of junior high and most of high school in a small town outside of Memphis. So I spent a lot of time on the road. And um, my Uncle Bill and my Aunt Virgie uh, played blues music a lot when we were traveling down south. I travel a lot now for work. I do other things too. And uh, I have a playlist on my phone. And so I put my hood up and put my earbuds in. And, you know, I jam out to the Black Panther soundtrack or Beyonce. <laughs> So I wanted to create something that would allow people to put themselves in the in the moment and in the mood for wherever they are on the trail. Now, you know, we're living in this pandemic that makes it difficult to travel, but there's also, you know, we're living in an age of virtual tours and museums. Um, so we can explore a lot of these places without ever leaving home. Why do you think it's important to be there in person? I don't know. There's something about the special energy of being in a particular space in a particular place. For example, in Birmingham, you can actually touch the jail bars of the jail that uh, Martin Luther King was in when he wrote the letter from a Birmingham jail. So, you know, when you travel, you travel in your mind's eye before you actually ever hit the road. So you can start reading and planning now, but then there's value in going to these places and experiencing them close up. What was it like for you personally to, to physically stand in some of those, you know, what are for some of us hallowed grounds? Yeah, I make a point of this in the book. It can be emotional. And so you're just really taking all, all of the information in. And I also thought a lot about, well, how would I have comported myself back in those times? You know, I write a lot about uh, nonviolent direct action. Would I have been able to be as disciplined as the activists were during that time? A lot of times the emotions came down on me after I got back, or maybe when I got on the plane and I was processing, and then I'm looking at the timeline of what happened to make another thing happen, to make another thing happen. And so then, you know, I would just maybe get gripped with anger or sadness, but very often I was just left awestruck at what these people risk to basically get the freedoms that we all enjoy today. Absolutely. Um, also, unlike most travel guides, this one includes a forward looking chapter, uh, encouraging readers to get educated on civil rights topics and history, even organized um, with some civil rights action book recommendations. What was your call to action at the end of this book? I didn't want people to think that this was about something that's happened and then it's over. It's not over. Uh, look at the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, a movement that the New York Times said was the largest social justice movement in the history of this country. So this book is about the past, but it's also all about now. All about now, even your foreword having been written uh, by Bree Newsom Bass. Tell us briefly about her and why she wrote the foreword. 
Well, um, I wanted her to. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I, I really wanted Brie to be present because uh, she's from a younger generation. And again, the point was that even though I, I gave a platform uh, for our elders to speak out on every page of this book, I also wanted young people to find a point of entry and relevance for this book. And because of what she was able to accomplish by scaling the pole in South Carolina and taking that Confederate flag down at the uh, South Carolina State House, squarely positions her in uh, this moment in terms of the civil rights, social justice uh, through line. Right, yeah, and I've got a Spotify playlist uh, to go and make, Deborah. Again, the book is called The U.S. Civil Rights Trail, A Traveler's Guide to the People, Places, and Events that made the moment. Our thanks to Deborah Douglas for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. With all the time spent inside during the past year and now the winter's gray, we thought it would be refreshing to show you a little green. We said hello to a local plant lover, I don't write this stuff, and the owner of a plant shop to see how house plants have helped them thrive throughout the pandemic. Here's WTTW News Director and Chicago Tonight Latino Voices host Ugo Balta with the story. Shalom Parker was already a houseplant fan when the pandemic began in the spring. I've always kind of liked them and like two years ago when I moved into this apartment, I started buying a couple, but I was in school and have a lot of money, so I probably only had like five or ten. But when a new job gave the ceramics artist and therapist more spending money and pandemic induced shutdowns gave her more time at home, her plant love really began to flourish. This was really like the start of my buying plants for this season. I went from probably having 10 plants last year into having over 60 plants now. With the stay at home order, it was like really, really cool to be able to create a space and using plants to decorate my space was like really important to me. And then in the process, I've learned a lot about the plants and found out all the names and the caring and the buying humidifiers and grow lights. Parker says one of her favorite stops for plants is the plant salon in Noble Square. This is a polia, also known as a money plant. I actually got it from the plant salon probably like three weeks after she opened. Um, I was really excited to go see a black owned shop. Oftentimes it's black owned and minority owned businesses that get left out. And so I wanted to be very intentional about how I spent my money and what I'm supporting in the midst of my plant love. Plant salon owner Nika Vaughn says the pandemic had a hand in her shop's story too. This wasn't always the plant salon. In fact, in the beginning of the pandemic, you decided to turn a hobby into a blossoming business. Tell us about that. This space originally, for the previous two years or so, was Nike Von Bridal Artists, and it was our beauty wedding business. And then May 2020, it kind of hit home how long the new normal might last and the shutdown and everything, especially for the wedding business and the beauty side. It was such a double whammy. And I think because I already felt comfortable running a small business, and I kind of had those resources that pivoting and starting to look at, okay, what does it mean to sell plant product? What are the channels I need to find out? What are the, the resources I can utilize in the community? It was, we moved very quickly and the community was ready for more plants and it really worked out. Vaughn uses social media to nurture city dwellers' newfound interest in houseplants and help them in caring for their charges. There was such an influx of new plant parents, um, and there's so many, right, all at once, was uh, we live in a city, we have a lot of apartments with odd lighting situations, and people would come in so excited, and then they would say, I have one, one window in my room. And you're like, okay. And so you show them plants that really meet those needs. Now there's a culture to planting. Please share with us your planting story. My mom used to have red geraniums that were by our patio door and I picked the petals off and I would stick them on my fingernails to have red nails and if that's not like super meta for my whole like world and people who love planting and indoor plants and I think gardening in general you're proud of it because you're like part artist I think you're part like scientist you're part like chef concocting things and trying ideas out and you know there's no right answer. So it's kind of like what works right now and then you compare notes with other people. And so it really does encourage the idea of a community. For urban dwellers hoping to join the houseplant community, Vaughn has a recommendation, the hardy ZZ plant. It's almost like a succulent. It holds a lot of its own water. 
and it doesn't need to be watered so often, and it can tolerate much lower light than a lot of plants can. So it is like the go-to plant for like urban lower light dwelling. And Shalom Parker, who has no shortage of light in her apartment, says watching her plants thrive is helping her thrive in this chaotic year. For me, a lot of the pandemic has been learning how to care for myself better. So slowing down and taking care of plants every morning has been a part of my routine that has been really, really important to me. Um, and has helped me to really just to slow down um, and focus on the plant's growth and my growth at the same time. Again, that was Ugo Balta, WTTW News Director and host of Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. You can find more on this story on our website. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news, for the very latest from WTTW News, including updates on the push and pull to reopen Chicago public schools. And join Paris Schutz and me this week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, sponsoring a free continuing legal education program for over a decade for lawyers across the state.